Praise the Lord. We thank the Lord for our Tuesday leadership development tonight once again. Let's pray together. Father, we do thank you for the privilege of serving you, serving Christ, serving the body of Christ. Lord, we thank you for the privilege. We pray, Lord, we'll not gamble, play with the privilege in Jesus' name. We're asking, Lord, as we come for training, for development, and for upliftment tonight, for deeper understanding of your word, and for development of our personality as shepherds, as pastors, as leaders, that your word will penetrate every heart tonight in Jesus' name, and we'll be better leaders, better fathers, better shepherds, and better Christians in Jesus' name. We well, thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Tonight, we're coming to the book of the Psalms. You understand? The Psalms uh, give us real spiritual insight into relationship with God, relationship with one another, and fulfilling the calling that God has given everyone. Either the call to salvation, to be a child of God, or the call to sanctification, to live holy and pure, preparing in readiness for heaven, or uh, to develop us and give us insight into who a shepherd, a leader, a minister ought to be. Actually, as we look at the Psalms, it touches every area of life, every experience in life. That's why the Psalms are very important in the Scriptures. Tonight, we're coming to the study of Psalm 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, and 21. Quite a lot. But there is one word that goes on in most of these Psalms we're looking at tonight, and it's the word trust. The word trust. Go with me now to Psalm 16, Psalm 16 verse 1. It says in Psalm 16 verse 1, Preserve me, O God, for in thee do I put my trust. That's the word. Look at verse 2. In verse 2 it says, So my soul, thou hast said unto the Lord, Thou art my Lord, that's still trusting the Lord, my goodness extendeth not to thee. That is the goodness I may have, the works of my heart, they cannot reach unto God. I need to trust the Lord. If I'm going to be of any value, of any weight, of any significance here in life. Let's come to Psalm 17. We're looking at verse 6. In Psalm 17, verse 6, I have called upon thee. For thou wilt hear me, O God, incline thine ear unto me, and hear my speech. Verse 7 tells us, it says in verse 7, Show thy marvelous loving kindness, O thou that savest by thy right hand them that put their trust, their trust, their trust in thee from those that rise up against them. And then in verse 8, it says in verse 8, Keep me as the apple of the eye. Hide me under the shadow of thy wings. So see, he's talking about trusting the Lord. It tells us in Psalm 18, looking at verse 2. Psalm 18, verse 2, still talks about trusting the Lord. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength. Look at this. In whom I will trust. In whom I will trust. My buckler and the horn of my salvation and my high tower. And look at verse 30 of that same Psalm 18. As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is tried. He is a buckler to all those that, this is the word again, that trust in him. He's talking about trusting the Lord. And you understand what the scriptures say in Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6. It says that if we're going to please God, we have to have faith in God. 
because he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And what the New Testament refers to as faith, believing in God, the Old Testament refers to as trusting God and trusting in God and trusting the name of God and trusting the watch of the Lord, the efficacy of the word, the power of the word, the transforming virtue of the word. In Psalm 19, it tells us in verse 7, Psalm 19 verse 7 says, the law of the Lord is perfect. That's why I trust that word, converting the soul. That's why we trust the word for us to be saved. We trust the word. We believe the word. We have faith in the word. For us to be sanctified, we trust the word. We believe in the word. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. And to be filled with the Holy Ghost, we trust in the promise of the Father. And the promise of the Lord Jesus Christ, the word that abides, that even though heaven and earth, shall pass away, the word of the Lord shall not pass away. It converts, it saves, it sanctifies, it fills with the Holy Ghost, even to be healed with trust in the word. It is the word, the saint is word, and he healed them and delivered them from all their afflictions, and to be delivered from any power, any power of darkness, any power of oppression, with trust in the word. That's why as we look at this as we're looking at tonight, is trust in the Lord, is trusting his name, it is trusting in his word. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. It tells us in Psalm 19, verse 8. In verse 8, it tells us the statutes of the Lord are right. That's why we trust those statutes. Rejoicing in the heart, the commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. And then it tells us in verse 9, in verse 9 it says the fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. And there is no error. The infallible word of God, the pure word of God, because it's so pure and because it's uh, eternal and because it's infallible, that's how we trust. That's why the central theme and the central word and the central principle and the central teaching in all these Psalms is trusting the Lord. Come to Psalm 20 and we're looking at verse 6. Psalm 20 verse 6, it says, Now know I that the Lord saveth is anointed. He will hear him from his holy heaven with the saving strength of his right hand. And then in verse 7, it tells us in verse 7, some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. It says others may trust whatever they want to trust, but we trust in the name of the Lord. We will remember, we get at any crossroad, we remember the name of the Lord. We get into any conflict, any affliction, any difficulty, any challenge, we trust in the name, we remember that name. He has given us that that name. And as you come to the New Testament, it says, whatever you ask in my name, you're asking the Father, that I will do. And we remember that name anytime there's any problem, while others trust in chariots, while others trust in horses, we remember and we trust the name of the Lord our God. In Psalm 21, reading from verse 6, Psalm 21 verse 6, for thou hast made him most blessed forever. Thou hast made him exceeding glad with thy countenance. Look at verse 7. In verse 7 it says, for the king trusteth in the Lord. The king trusteth in the Lord. He said, before I became a king, I had to trust in the Lord. And after becoming a king, I trust in the Lord. And he uses the word trust now in the present continuous tense. I keep on trusting the Lord. What challenges kings have? What challenges leaders have? What challenges pastors have? What challenges ministers have? And what challenges children of God, the people of God have here on earth? It's made us kings and priests unto our God. And we who are now kings 
under knees and under the authority of the king of kings. The king must keep on trusting in the Lord. And through the mercy of the Most High, he shall not be moved. Obviously, then you see that in the Psalms we are looking at today, that what trust runs through like a, like a chain. And tonight we are making the, the title of the message is Knowing God and Trusting Him, Trusting Him Alone. Knowing God and Trusting Him Alone. We are not trusting the God of this world. We are not trusting another God, an idol. We're not trusting the powers of darkness. We're not trusting anything that is not of God. We're not trusting even ourselves. All we trust is God, knowing God and trusting him alone. The three things we're looking at as we study the Psalms tonight, number one, the titles and the trustworthiness of the Almighty God. The titles and the trustworthiness of the Almighty God. Point number two, the tragedy and the tribulation for trusting another God. The tragedy and tribulation of trusting another God. Point number three now, our transformation and triumph through the approachable God. Our transformation and triumph through the approachable God. As you look at the Psalms, you can see the ease with which the psalmist approached God. The psalmist approached God without any difficulty at all. And we need to understand that as we come before the Lord, he is approachable, he is available, and he is abundantly willing to bless us especially now that Jesus Christ died for us, that Jesus Christ gave himself, and then he opened the way. By the blood of the sacrifice, he opened the way unto God. And through Jesus Christ now, in the name of Jesus, by the atonement of Jesus, by the redemptive act of the Lord Jesus Christ, now we can approach God, and as we approach God, because of Jesus and through the Lord Jesus, there is transformation and there is triumph all through our lives. Point number three, our transformation and triumph through the approachable God. We're coming to point number one now. Point number one, the titles and the trustworthiness of the Almighty God. We're coming back to Psalm 16 and we're reading from verse 1. In verse 16, verse 1, preserve me, O God, for in thee do I put my trust. In verse 2, it tells us in verse 2, O my soul, thou hast said unto the Lord, thou art my Lord. Thou art my Lord. That's one of the titles, my Lord. And then my goodness extendeth not unto thee. My self-righteousness, my goodness by myself cannot extend to thee, cannot touch you. Because it is, it is so short, we have come short of the glory of God. It is the goodness of the Lord that extends to us and then brings us to God. It tells us in Psalm 18, reading verses 1 and 2. In Psalm 18, reading from verse 1, I will love thee, O Lord, my strength. Look at that title of God, my strength. And then in verse 2, he gives us a lot of the titles now. The Lord is my rock. The Lord is my fortress. The Lord is my deliverer. He is my God, my strength, in whom I will trust. He is my buckler. The Lord is the horn of my salvation. The Lord is my high tower. The titles and the trustworthiness of the Almighty God. Three things we're looking at. Number one, the timelessness of God. The timelessness of God. That means it's been here all the time. And it's been here before time. From eternity to eternity. From everlasting to everlasting. Our God has been there. Look at Psalm 16 verse 8. In Psalm 16 verse 8. I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. And then he tells us in verse 11, in verse 11, thou will show me the path of life. In thy presence is the fullness of joy. 
at thy right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. There are pleasures forevermore. Is eternal one. He has been from eternity. And look at uh, Deuteronomy chapter 33 and verse 27. Deuteronomy chapter 33, we're looking at verse 27. The eternal God, timeless God, the eternal God, infinite God, the eternal God, everlasting God is thy refuge and underneath at the everlasting arms. He uses the word eternal. He uses the word everlasting. And he shall thrust out the enemy from before thee and shall say, destroy them. The point is, is eternal. The point is, is everlasting. The point is, is infinite. The point is, is uh, timeless. The timelessness of the Almighty God is some nighty. Psalm 90, looking at verse 1, in Psalm 90, verse 1, is talking about the eternality of God. It says, Lord, thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations. The psalmist said, I cannot think of any generation where God was not uh, pointedly uh, visible in action. Then he tells us in verse 2, in verse 2 it says, before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou had formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. The timelessness of God, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. It tells us in Isaiah chapter 57, looking at verse 15. Isaiah chapter 57, we're reading from verse 15. It's still talking about the very fact that God is eternal. God has always been there and before you were born Christ God was there and after you were born God was there and after you leave this world God will still be there and if you associate with God if you interact with God if you become related with God if you are born again you become a child of God then forever and ever you will be with him it says in Isaiah chapter 57 looking at verse 15 for those says the high and lowly one that inhabiteth eternity. Mark that your Bible, he inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. He inhabited eternity in Jeremiah chapter 10. We're looking at verse 10. Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 10, it says, But the Lord is the true God, the Lord, the God of heaven, the creator of the heavens and the earth. He is the true God. He is the living God. Look at this, look at this. An everlasting king, an everlasting king. At his wrath, the earth shall tremble, and the nations shall not be able to abide his indignation. And then we come to First Timothy chapter 1, verse 17. First Timothy chapter 1, verse 17. Now unto the king eternal. Now unto the king everlasting. Now unto the king eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory. Look at this. Forever and ever and everybody over there say, Amen. The Lord is eternal. The Lord is everlasting. From everlasting to everlasting, he has been God. Now, the truthfulness of the Almighty God. We're coming to a second session there. We go back to the Psalms. We're coming to Psalm 19, and we're reading from verse 9. The truthfulness of the Almighty God. It says, the fear of the Lord is clean enduring forever the judgments of the lord are true is truthfulness the judgments of the lord are true and the statements of the lord and the proclamations of the lord and the pronouncements of the lord are true and righteous all together the truthfulness of the almighty god in deuteronomy chapter 32 deuteronomy chapter 32 looking at verse 4 it says he is the rock his work is perfect for all his ways are judgment, a God of truth. 
a God of truth, a God of truth. In everything he says, is a God of truth. In everything he does, is a God of truth. In every program, is a God of truth. In every principle, is a God of truth. In any dealing, any relationship with man, with Israel, with the church, in any dispensation, is a God of truth. And without iniquity, just and righteous is he. Look at uh, Numbers chapter 23. We're looking at verse 19. Numbers chapter 23. And we're reading from verse 19. It says, God is not a man that he should lie. He's a God of truth and the truthfulness of God permeates every action of his. He is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. As he said, and shall he not do it? As he said, he will save, and shall he not do it? As he said, he'll make holy, he'll make righteous, and shall he not do it? As he said, he will baptize you in the Holy Ghost and with power, and shall he not do it? As he said, he will heal. As he said, he will deliver, and he will not do it. As he said, he'll prepare a place for you in heaven, and you'll be a child of God, a son of God, and you'll live forever with him. As he said, what has he promised that he will not fulfill? What has he given that you will not enjoy, that you will not receive? As he said, and shall he not do it? As he spoke in, and shall he not make it good? Is the God of truth. In 2 Samuel chapter 7, reading from verse 28. 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 28. And now, O Lord God, and now, O oh Lord God, you see at every time, whether it's at the time of David or it's at the time of Elijah or it's at the time of Peter, at the time of Paul, or at your own time, at your own time, everything is now, now, now. At this time of your challenge, at this time of your difficulty, you can approach God and say, and now, O oh Lord God, thou art God, thou art God, always God. When you're sick, it's always God. And when you're perplexed, it's always God. When there's confusion, it's always God. And when there's commotion all over the world, when there is a pandemic all over the world, He is God. Thou art God, and Thy words be true. And Thy words be true. And Thou hast promised this goodness unto Thy servant. Look at the consequence of that. Verse 25, chapter 7, verse 25. And now, Always now, always now, God is not just a God of the past and then a God of the future. He's a God of the present time. And now, O oh Lord God, the word that thou hast spoken concerning the servants and concerning Hena, his house to establish it forever. Look at this. And do as thou hast said. You are the true God, and do as thou hast said. You are the God that cannot fail, and do as thou hast said. You are the eternal one. You are the truthful one. You are the faithful one. You are the one that cannot fail. You are the infallible one. You are promised, do as thou hast said. You know, when you come to the Lord for anything at all, even from the point of salvation, he says he will forgive. All we need to do is say, do as thou hast said. He says he will sanctify. Do as thou hast said. He says he will heal. Do as thou hast said. It's Jehovah Jireh. He says he'll provide. My God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory. All we need to say is, look at the promise of God. Look at what was spoken about thy servant, about thy child, and about his house and then about the members of the church, all you are praying for is due as thou hast said because of the truthfulness of God. In Titus chapter 1, we're looking at verse 2. Titus chapter 1, we're reading from verse 2. It tells us, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie, it's impossible for him to lie, which God that cannot lie has promised before the world began. Remember, it's eternal. And remember, anything and everything he had promised in the past is still able to do today. 
is still a walking and doing everything today because he cannot lie. He had promised all this before the world began and what he promised he will do. Hebrews chapter 6, reading from verse 18. In Hebrews chapter 6, verse 18, that by two immutable things, immutable, unchangeable things, immutable, unutterable things, you couldn't change, you cannot change, nobody can change the nature of God. Even Satan cannot change the nature of God. Demons cannot change the nature of God. By two immutable things, unalterable things, unchangeable things, in the which it was impossible for God to lie. Impossible for God to lie. That's not in his nature. From all eternity until the present time and to the future eternity, it is impossible for God to lie. We might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us. And then he tells us in verse 19, it says, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul. At the present time, that hope we have as an anchor of the soul. Both sure and steadfast, and which enters into that within the veil. It's telling us, number one, the timelessness of the Almighty God. Telling us, number two, the truthfulness of the Almighty God. Number three now, is talking to us about the trustworthiness of the Almighty God. The trustworthiness of the Almighty God. Let's come back to the Psalms. In Psalm 18, we're looking at verse 2. It says, the Lord is my rock. And the Lord is my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength, in whom I will trust. It's trustworthy. It's trustworthy. It's a rock, and the wind cannot move that rock, and situations, circumstances cannot change that rock, and the waters and the sea and the ocean may beat against that wall. Nothing can change that rock, and the Lord is like that. He is my rock. He is my fortress. I can hide in that fortress. I'm protected in that fortress. I am safe in that fortress. I'm secured in that fortress. He is my deliverer. He's stronger than Satan. He's stronger than demons. He's stronger than any power on earth. And whatever power holds anyone, he is the deliverer, my deliverer, my God, my strength. And if you're weak, he is your strength and he is trustworthy. And you can come to the Lord. If you're sick, he'll heal you. If you're weak, he'll strengthen you. If you are kind of depressed, it will cheer you up and bring your life again. New life will come into you. My strength in whom I will trust, my buckler, my shield, my buckler, my protector, and the horn of my salvation, and my high tower. Look at verse 3. In verse 3, it tells us, I will call upon the Lord. We will pray. I'll call upon the Lord. What's the challenge? We have someone and we have the great God. We have the Almighty who is able to solve all problems and who is able to get you out of any net and get you out of any challenge, out of any dungeon. And because of that, he's trustworthy. And because he's trustworthy, his promises are yes and amen in Christ. Because of that, I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from mine enemies. It tells us in Psalm 36, reading from verse 7. Psalm 36, verse 7, it says, How excellent is thy loving kindness, O God, Therefore, the children of men put their trust under the shadow of thy wings. He said, it's not only the king of Israel. It's not only the people of Israel. Everyone, it says, therefore, the children of men in any generation, the children of men in this generation, the children of men in any dispensation, the children of men in this dispensation, it says, because your loving kindness is excellent, 
It says, therefore, because of that, O God, the children of men put their trust under the shadow of thy wings. Look at verse 8. In verse 8, it says, they shall be abundantly satisfied with the fatness of thy house. The people who put their trust in God, they, all those people, you trust him for salvation. You trust him for sanctification. You trust him for power in the Holy Ghost. And you trust him for healing. You trust him for deliverance. You trust him to be successful in ministry. They shall be abundantly satisfied with the fatness of thy house. And thou shalt make them drink of the river of thy pleasures. Look at verse 9 there. In verse 9, for with thee is the fountain of life. That's why we trust him. For with thee is the fountain of life. You need life, eternal life, everlasting life, abundant life, spiritual life, happy life, joyful life, successful life, progressing life. We trust him, for with thee is the fountain of life. In thy light shall we see light. It tells us in Psalm 89, Psalm 89, verse 34, it says, My covenant will I not break. Here comes assurance from the Lord. My covenant will I not break. Here comes the affirmation of the Lord concerning his covenant and concerning his word. My covenant will I not break nor alter the thing that has gone out of my lips, nor alter the things that has gone out of my lips. It tells us in Matthew chapter 24, verse 35. Matthew chapter 24, verse 35, it says, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. It says, the sky and the stars and the galaxies and the universe and the planets may move out of their orbits and the earth itself may shake and be shaking and even pass away. But my word shall not pass away. The word Christ has spoken. The word God himself through Christ has manifested. He says, my word shall not pass away. He doesn't have any variable of change. He does not change. That's why we trust him. Look at James chapter 1, verse 17. In James chapter 1, verse 17, we're praying to a God who will not alter his word. We're praying to a God who will not change his plan. We're praying to a God who is not moved by anything Satan or demons or powers of darkness may do. We're praying to a God who has promised good things for your soul, for your spirit, for your body, and for your time, present life, and for your future. We're praying to a God and we're talking to a God who is the same all the time. He is timeless. He is uh, truthful and he is trustworthy. Look at James chapter 1, verse 17. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. No variableness or shadow of turning. That's why we can now read with confidence Acts chapter 27, reading from verse 25, Acts 27, verse 25, Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe God that it shall be, even as it was told me, brother, be of good cheer, sister, be of good cheer, Believers, be of good cheer. Ministers of God, be of good cheer. Their wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer. Paul the apostle was on his storm, and the storm was still there, and it was going to break the shape in which it was. Everybody was panicking. When you see 276 people all panicking, the intelligent, and then the passengers, the captain, everybody panicking, and then in the midst of that confusion, in the midst of that commotion, he rose up, and he was the only one believing the words of the Lord. 
and you might be in the minority. Even if you are the only one believing the word of the Lord, you can say confidently, you can say truthfully, wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe God. He didn't say, for we believe God. He was standing alone. I believe God that it shall be, even as it was told me. The same thing you can say, and the same thing you can have in your mind, and the same thing you can confirm, you can tell everybody around when they are panicking, when they are afraid, they don't know what is going to happen. You can say, wherefore, brothers and sisters, wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe God that it shall be even as it was told me. Why? Because it's timeless. Why? Because it's truthful. Why? Because it's trustworthy. We come to point number two now. In point number two is the tragedy and the tribulation for trusting another God. For trusting another God. Looking at God who is light. Looking at God who is eternal. Looking at God who is truthful looking at God who cannot fail, looking at God who cannot lie, looking at God who is infallible, and then leaving that God, abandoning that God, and going to trust another God with a small g, a diminutive God, a, hum a man-made God, and a Satan-inspired God, and leaving God, the true God, and then going to the false gods, there is tragedy. And there is tribulation for those who leave God to go and serve another God. The tragedy and tribulation for trusting another God. In Psalm 16 verse 4. Psalm 16 verse 4. Their sorrows shall be multiplied. Their sicknesses shall be multiplied. Their sufferings shall be multiplied that hasting after another God. Their drink offerings of blood will I not offer, nor take up their names into my leaves. And let's look at three things here. Number one, the transgression of trusting another God. It's a great sin. It's a great evil. It's a great iniquity. The transgression of trusting another God. Point number two, the temptation of trying another God. When there's been a problem and then you are prayed, but the Lord is wanting you to have importunity in prayer, perseverance in prayer, is wanting to have unshakable faith in the God that cannot fail, and then because the answer has not come at that minute, you are tempted, the temptation of trying another God. I pray you'll not fall into that temptation. Number three, the torment for turning to another God. The torment that will come, the punishment that will come, and the eternal pain that will come for turning to another God. Let's look at number one, the transgression of trusting another God. It tells us in Deuteronomy chapter 6, reading from verse 14. Deuteronomy chapter 6, we're reading from verse 14. It says, ye shall not go after other gods of the gods of the people which are around about you. Are you living? Of course, you're living in the community. And all those people around you, whether you're in the city, whether you're in a town, whether you're in a village, they trust and know that God, anytime they have any challenge, any problem, they always have their God they're going to call to in the plural. And it says, he shall not go after all the gods of the gods of the people which are around about you. In verse 15, it says, for the Lord thy God is a jealous God among you, lest the anger of the Lord thy God be kindled against thee and destroy thee from off the face of the earth. It's a great transgression to leave the living, the living God and to leave the truthful God and to leave the infallible God, to leave the eternal God and then go and go to a man-made God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, reading from verse 20. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, reading from verse 20. But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils. 
the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. And I would not that it should have fellowship with devils. When people go to another God, it's a great sin because they're going to devils, they're going to the demons, they're going to Satan, and they're having fellowship with Satan with the demons. It tells us in verse 21, in verse 21, it says, ye cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of, the, of devils. Ye cannot partake be partakers of the Lord's table and of the table of devils. You cannot, uh, you know, share your allegiance and you cannot share your faithfulness or your trust and say, I trust God on Sunday and then Monday through Saturday you are trusting another God. That's the way of the sinner. That's the way of the transgressor. That's the way of the people that really do not have faith in God. They gauge their service, they gauge their worship by the pain they have in the body and by the circumstances of their lives. If things are not all right, they cannot go to the God who cannot fail. They cannot go to the God. They will not go to the God of heaven and the God who created everything. They have to go to one God behind the screen somewhere and they serve devils. It says in verse 22, in verse 22, do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? Second Corinthians chapter 11, reading from verse 3. In Second Corinthians chapter 11, we're looking at verse 3. The Lord is assuring us that he is the one that is true. But we must, be, uh, we must be careful. We must be watchful that we're not deceived. When there's any challenge, when there's any problem, that thoughts do not arise in the earth to seek after another God. That's why Paul the Apostle said in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3, But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled, deceived him, through the through his subtlety, so your minds be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Very simple. We ask the Lord, like you know, you have seen him before you, and he answers your prayer, and he says he's a very he's very much afraid for the for the Corinthians, so that their hearts, their minds will not be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. In verse 4, it says, For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom ye have not whom we have not preached. Or if ye have received another spirit which ye have not received, or another gospel which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. There are people that come and they preach another God, another Christ, another spirit, another way of getting healed, of getting delivered. And it says those who do that, they are transgressing. Galatians chapter 1 Verse, nine, verse 6, Galatians chapter 1, we're reading from verse 6. It's telling us, it says, I marvel, talking to the Galatian believers, I marvel that she has so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, another God, another Christ, another message, another gospel, another understanding, another faith. The people who are shifting is a great transgression in the sight of God. In verse 7, it says in verse 7, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and will pervert the gospel of Christ. In verse 8, in verse 8, it says, but the we or an angel from heaven Preach any other gospel unto you than that which were preached unto you. Let him be a cause. Do you understand that? It says, though we on Sunday will preach the word of God in the light, we preach the word of God and we point to the eternal God. We point to the timeless God. We point to the truthful God. We point to the trustworthy God that will do very well preaching sound doctrine on Sunday. 
preaching some doctrine in the public. Any day will preach. But in the private, somebody has a problem and it comes to you for counseling and then you know somebody somewhere and you know another God somewhere and you know another entity somewhere and you know another power somewhere and during the week, if you direct them to another God, another gospel, that's why it says, do we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which were preached unto you, let him be a cause. Look at how strong it is in verse 9. In verse 9, as we said before, so say I now again. As we said before, so say I now again. You know, Paul the Apostle, the moment he gave his life to the Lord, he believed in the God of heaven. And he believed through the Lord Jesus Christ, through the saving grace of Christ. And from that time, he kept on pointing people to God, eternal one. And he said, if you're going to have life, it's through Jesus Christ. And he believed in the name of the Lord. And he said, as I said before, so say I now, you know, there are people who are changed by circumstances. They became sick. They became oppressed. They became tormented. They had problems. They had challenges. And the messengers of Satan buffeting them. And then they themselves now, if they're already changing, if they're already turning aside, when, if they're still preaching, they cannot say what they used to say. They cannot affirm what they used to affirm because now their own sickness, their own infirmity, their own uh, disease that came upon them has led them one way or the other to another gospel. They change a little and they say, you know, we cannot be too strong. Anywhere you find help, any, anyone that can give you help, well, what can I say? Well, I'm not telling you to go, but you know, this one is in your hand. They cannot talk, they cannot affirm, they cannot be confident as they were before. The circumstances of their personal lives have, have changed them. But Paul, the apostle, remained firm. He said, as we said before, so say I now again, if any man, if any man preach any other gospel, introduce any other God, introduces another Christ, another spirit, if any man preach any other gospel unto you, than that ye have received, let him be a curse. The look at the temptation, the temptation of trying another God. Temptations come to people. But it's only yielding to that temptation that brings sin. Look at the temptation, Deuteronomy chapter 13. We're reading from verse 1. Deuteronomy chapter 13, verse 1. If there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams and giveth thee a sign or a wonder, in verse 2, and the sign and the wonder come to pass, whereof he spake unto thee, saying, Let us go after other gods, another God. Let us go after other gods, which thou hast not known, and let us serve them. Look at verse 3. In verse 3, it says, Thou shalt not hack him. Understand? That's a temptation. Somebody comes to you introducing another God, another Christ, another Jesus, different from the Jesus of the New Testament, the one that died and was buried and rose again the third day, the one that said, it is finished. And all your problems you take unto the Lord through Christ. If this person comes now and introduces another God, I want you to have faith in another spiritual, supernatural entity. It's a temptation. Thou shalt not hearken unto the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. For the Lord your God proves you, tries you. 
to know whether ye love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Then in verse 4, it says, in verse 4, ye shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice and ye shall serve him and cleave unto him. We must not yield to the temptation of following another God. In 1 Kings chapter 12, reading from verse 27. 1 Kings chapter 12, and we're looking at verse 27. If these people, here is, uh, here is um, Jeroboam now saying, uh, if these people go up to sacrifice in the house of the Lord at Jerusalem, then shall the heart of these people turn again unto their Lord, even unto Rehoboam, king of Judah. And they shall kill me and go again to Rehoboam, king of Judah. That was uh, Jeroboam strategizing. That was Jeroboam saying uh, these people, if they go to Jerusalem, according to the word of the Lord, and they worship there, if they go to that chief city and worship there, if they go to that place of God's appointment and worship there, they remember, they recollect David and then Solomon and then his son Rehoboam. And they'll forget me and they might even kill me because of that. Look at verse 28. In verse 28, wherefore the king, that's Jeroboam, took counsel and made two calves of gold and said unto them, it is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. It's like I pity you. It's like I sympathize with you. It's like I'm considering you the effort you take and the thing you do, the things you do to go to Jerusalem. Is that not too much for you? It is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Behold thy gods, O Israel, that brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. Verse 29. In verse 29, and he set the one in Bethel, and the other he put in Dan. Verse 30, in verse 30 it says, And this sin became a sin. The people yielded to the temptation. They didn't understand that uh, Jeroboam had a strategy. Jeroboam had his plan. Jeroboam wanted to turn their minds away from Rehoboam, from the house of David. But he got more than he bargained for. He turned their hearts away from the truthful God and from the true God. You see people, when they make uh, something for you or for anyone and they tempt them uh, to commit sin, they go farther than they intended. Now it says, and the sin became a sin, for the people went to worship before the one even unto Dan. Temptation, I pray you'll not yield to temptation. I said, I pray you'll not yield to temptation. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13 and verse 14. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, we're reading from verse 13. There has no temptation taking you, the temptation to go to another God, the temptation to try another God, the temptation to trust another God. There has no temptation taking you, but such as is common to man. It's common. When you're sick, your relatives will come. Why don't you try this other place we're here in? They also carry Bible, and uh, they also have oil, and they also have, uh, you know, some kind of incantation. They join with that oil, and they also do some things in the night. They also do some sacrifices, but they carry the Bible. The temptation comes to everyone. When you have a long-standing problem, your relatives might come. Backsliders might come. Even those who have prayed to you before, who were leaders over you before, they might say, well, uh, you, you understand, we're sympathizing with you. Like Jeroboam, they can divert you to another God. It's the temptation. You will not yield to that temptation. I was waiting for your amen. 
Amen. You will not yield to such temptation in Jesus' name. There is no temptation taking you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way for you to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. Look at the conclusion of that in verse 14. It says, Wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. Hold on, hold on. This is the church at Corinth. And these are the people, if you, we are not going to read that now, but if you go back to chapter 1, verse 5, verse 7, it says they were not behind in any gift of the Spirit. These were the people that rejoiced in the fact they had the gifts of the Spirit. They were the people that will say they had the word of knowledge at one time and the word of wisdom at another time and discerning of spirit at another time. But temptation came to them. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, flee from idolatry. These were the people that rejoice and brag in the understanding that they are the gift of faith and the healing of the sick and also the working of miracles. But all the same, the temptation. You know, my brother, my sister, it's not how strong you were some years ago in the things of the Spirit. At the present time, when there's any challenge, personal challenge, family challenge, professional challenge, any challenge, you, you know, in this uh, pandemic period, there are people, they introduce this, introduce that, and they introduce another assembly, another fellowship, because, you know, deeper life, only word of God, only word of God, they count the eternal word as only, and they count the eternal name of Christ as only, they say only the name of Christ, only Bible, they count this Bible, the watch of the everlasting God that can save, that can sanctify, that can heal, that can deliver. They count this word that will make us from here to get to heaven. They say only Bible. Yes, the Bible. And the Bible is the solution, the answer to everyone. The temptation may come. Therefore, it says, wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry because if we don't look at number three there the torments of turning to another god the torment of turning to another god in exodus chapter 32 exodus chapter 32 and we're reading from verse 8 exodus chapter 32 verse 8 they have turned aside is God talking to Moses about the children of Israel? They have turned aside quickly out of the way, which I commanded them. They have made them a molten calf and have worshipped it. They have made them a molten calf and they were worshipping out the work of their hand, the products of their hand. The creation of their, of their hand, the sin they carved out with their own hand, they took that as God. They have worshipped it and have sacrificed thereunto and said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which have brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. What happened to them then? Look at verse 10. In verse 10 it says, Now therefore... Let me alone that my wrath may wax hot against thee. Let me alone that my wrath, my indignation, my anger may wax hot against them. And I will consume them. And I will consume them. And I will make of thee a great nation. Look at verse 33. In verse 33 it says, And the Lord said unto Moses, Whosoever have sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book, whosoever has raised up another God, has gone to another God, him will I blot out of my book. You know, Satan is not dumb. Satan is not as, it's not like an idiot. Satan can give you something, so that it can take a greater thing away from you. It's lost heaven. It's lost relationship with God. He knows it's going to hell. 
and he knows the word of God. That if you turn away from the living God, from the true God, he knows that God will be angry at such a person. And so, let's say somebody is sick and has prayed and prayed. If that sickness itself came from the devil and he placed that thing on the man and the man says well i've been praying i don't know what is happening and i cannot get healed and then he goes to the devil one or two things may happen number one you may die like that and die in the shrine of demons and die in the shrine of the devil and if he dies like that where does he go he goes to eternal hell and there will be torments forever and ever he turns to another god and at the point of turning he did not survive he died like that or on the other hand the devil might say okay I'm going to do him some favor. I'll take the sickness I put on him. I'll take it away so that he'll become my agent and bring others to me. That's what the devil does. Either way, whether the person dies, there's torment. Whether the person does not die, his name is out of the book of life. Whosoever have sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. I pray the torment of forsaking God will not be upon your life in Jesus' name. We're coming to point number three now. Point number three is the transformation and the triumph we have through the approachable God. Remember, we're studying the Psalms. We're coming to Psalm 18 now, and we're reading from verse 32. Psalm 18, verse 32, it is God that guardeth me with strength and make it my way perfect. Here comes David. Here comes the psalmist. Here comes the believer in God. Here comes the one who has prayed to God and who has got answer from God. Here comes the one who believes that God, the God of yesterday, is the God of today. The God of today is the God of tomorrow. The God of the eternal past is the God of the present and is the God of the eternal future. And he says, I have a testimony to give. He has transformed formed me, it's made me triumphant. It is God that guardeth me with strength and maketh my way perfect. It tells us in verse 35, in verse 35 it says, Thou hast also given me the shield of thy salvation. You have given me uh, the, the, the protection of your salvation and thy right hand has holding me up and thy gentleness has made me great. Look at Psalm 65, we're looking at verse 4. Psalm 65, looking at verse 4, blessed is the man. Any man in any generation, blessed is the man whom thou choosest and causes to approach thee, approach unto thee, is the approachable God. We can approach unto him that he may dwell in thy cause. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of thy house, even of thy holy temple. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of thy house, even of thy holy temple. There's transformation as we trust in the Lord. There is transparency as we trust in the Lord. And there is a transference of his spirit as we trust in the Lord. Three things we're looking at. Number one is the transformation of sinners by their peace, God. By their peace, God. In Psalm 19, we're reading from verse 7. Psalm 19, verse 7, it tells us about the law of God, about the word of God. It tells us about this infallible word and this eternal word and this unalterable word and this uh, unchanging word, the word that transforms, the word that cleanses, and the word that changes everything in our lives. It says the law of the Lord is perfect. 
converting the soul. Even at this time now, there's a conversion of the soul by the watch of the Lord. You hear the watch of God, you embrace it, you believe it, you don't take anything out, you don't add anything to it, and that watch of the Lord brings conviction in your heart, and it drives you on your knees, and you call upon the Lord. You repent of every sin the Spirit of God brings to your remembrance, and you block those sins away I will never go back into them anymore. I come out of darkness. I come to the light. I come out of lawlessness and I come into the loyalty of the word of God and then I ask you, ask for the transforming power of the grace of God to touch your life and to transform you and then you are changed. That's conversion. That's conversion. And it's true conversion. It's total conversion. It's a conversion that starts in your heart and affects your mind and affects your soul and affects the works of your hand, affects your character. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. And then he tells us in verse 8, in verse 8 it says, the statutes of the Lord, the same thing, the commandments of the Lord, the statutes of the Lord, the law of the Lord, everything is still the word of God. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoice in the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. That's what turns us away from darkness and it turns us into light. And look at Isaiah chapter 1, reading from verse 16. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 16, wash you and make you clean. The word of God, ye are clean. Though the word that I've spoken unto you, take the word to heart and let the word act like water, act like detergent, and wash away every defilement, every uncleanness in your mind, in your heart, in your thought, in your soul, in your character, in your habit. Wash you and make you clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes. Cease to do evil. That's part of the repentance. When you repent, you actually make an effort. You turn away from all those sins of the past and you turn to the Lord and you cease to do evil. And then you ask for the grace of God that comes in your life, that turns you around completely and makes you a new creation in Christ. In verse 17, verse 17 says, Learn to do well. Learn to do well. Seek judgment. Relieve the oppressed. Judge the fatherless. Plead for the widows. Look at verse 18. Verse 18 says, come now. That's the word again, now. Don't delay your salvation. Come now. Don't delay the cleansing. Come now. Don't delay the transformation. Come now. Don't delay the triumph and the power you can have through the grace of God. Come now. Don't just hear the word. Let your weakness be turned to strength. And let your failures be turned unto, unto strength. Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Do your sins be as scarlet? They shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. It gives us transformation. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. We're reading from verse 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9. Know ye not that your righteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators. No idolaters, no adulterers, no effeminate, no abusers of themselves with mankind, no thieves in verse 10, no uh, covetous, no drunkards, no revilers, no extortioners shall inherit neither of them, none of them shall inherit the kingdom of God. Verse 11, there can be a transformation, there can be a change, it says, but such were in the past, such were before you came to Christ, such were before you were transformed, such were some of you. But ye are washed, 
but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. There is transformation in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, if any man in the first generation, in the first century, if any man be in Christ, the power of Christ has not changed. The power of God has not changed. As it was in his power, so he is in his power, and so he will ever be that same power of Christ. Anyone that comes in connection with Christ, that same transforming power is still working today as in the days of old. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, it's a new creature, it's a new creation. God actually recreates him because he comes to Christ, because he takes of the grace of Christ, because he takes of the virtue of Christ, God recreates him. He's a new creature. Old things are passed away, and behold, all things are become new. All things are become new. Look at verse 21. In verse 21, it tells us of the great exchange for he has made him to be seen for us. Christ became the sin offering for us who knew no sin that we who come to him now, that we who believe on him now, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. That we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Look at the second thing there, the transparency of seekers before the all-knowing God. We're coming back to the Psalms in Psalm 17, looking at verse 3. Psalm 17, looking at verse 3. When we come to the Lord, we don't hide anything. When we come to the Lord, we lay everything open before him at salvation. We lay everything open before him. We're not hiding any sin that we want to keep. We lay everything open. After we're saved, our lives are open before him. And when you're asking for sanctification, you are transparent. You come before him and you consecrate everything without any reservation. He says in Psalm 17, verse 3, Thou hast proved mine heart. Thou hast visited me in the night. Thou hast tried me and shall find nothing. And shall find nothing. I will not hide anything. I'll not keep any transgression in the corner of my heart. I will not lock up behind a locked door an item of sin or a sin partner that you will not see, that brethren will not see. He says, and shall find nothing. I am purposed that my mouth shall not transgress. I am purposed that whether I'm alone all by myself or I'm in the public with sinners, I'm in the public with believers, anywhere I am, I have a purpose now that I have been transformed and changed. I am purposed that I will not transgress with my mouth. Look at Psalm 19, verse 14. Psalm 19, verse 14, it tells us there, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. You are not hiding anything from the Lord. You are transparent before the Lord. And when you are like that, then the Lord himself will grant you great grace. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 4, verse 13. Hebrews chapter 4, we're looking at verse 13. It says, neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, neither is there any creature, sinner or saint, neither is there any creature, leader or follower, neither is there any creature, whether 
it's in the day or in the night, neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked, all things are naked and opened unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Look at verse 14 there. In verse 14, it tells us, Seeing them that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast a profession, a profession that he is eternal. Let us hold fast a profession a profession that he is timeless. Let us hold fast a profession, a profession that he is truthful. Let us hold fast a profession, a profession that he is trustworthy. Let us hold fast a profession. And then in verse 16, in verse 16, it says, and now let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace or to help in time of need. What's your need? What's my need? What's our need? As an individual, as a family, as a church, what's your need at easy times, at difficult times? What's your need at the time of pandemic? What's your need when you are at a crossroad? Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find help in the time of of need because now he will transfer the power of the spirit he'll transfer the promise of the spirit unto every one of our lives number three now is transference of his spirit by the anointing God. Here we're told in Psalm 18, reading from verse 50, Psalm 18, verse 50, great deliverance giveth he to his king. Great deliverance giveth he to his king and showeth mercy to his anointed, to David and to his seed forevermore. To David and to his seed, people like him that believe in the Lord, he gives us the mercy and he gives us all that we need forevermore. The power of the Spirit can be so uh, transferred into our lives that everything we need is given unto us. In fact, all the promises of God are now available. Great deliverance and great salvation and great healing and great impartation and great anointing he giveth now to the people of God and he will show mercy unto everyone. He tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 20. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 20. It says all the promises of God in him are yea and in him are amen unto the glory of God by us, all the promises of God, salvation, sanctification, Holy Ghost baptism, healing, deliverance, strength, provision, the riches, unsearchable riches of God, answers to prayer, all the promises of God in him are yea and in him amen unto the glory of God by us. Look at verse 21. In verse 21, now, that's the word, now, now, he which establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us. David was anointed, now he has anointed us, and Jesus Christ was anointed with the Holy Ghost and with power, and he went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed of the devil, and we too were anointed. He has anointed us, it's God who anointed us. Look at verse 22. In verse 22, it says, Who also has sealed us and given us the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. Today, we have learned in all these Psalms the necessity of knowing God and trusting Him, trusting Him alone. And now you can rise up on your feet and you can say, Lord, I thank you for the exposition of your word. I thank you for the truthfulness of your word. Now I trust you. Now I trust you. All the promises of God he has given, they are ready, they are available for you, they are available for me. All those promises of God in him are yes, 
He'll never say no. He said he was saved. When you come to him, he says yes. And when you say you need healing, he'll say yes. When you say you need deliverance, he'll say yes. And when you pray for the people under your leadership, you pray for the people that need counseling from you, that need help from you. And when you coach the promise of God on their behalf, God will never say no. He will say yes. And he will say, so let it be. That's the meaning of amen. So let it be. In your life, the promises of God, so let it be. In your family, the promises of God, so let it be. And in your ministry, the promises of God, so let it be. Remember, our God is timeless. Our God is almighty. The timelessness of the almighty God. The timelessness of the almighty God. What he did for Abraham, he'll do for you. What he did through Moses, he will do through you. What he did through Joshua, he'll do through you. He is timeless. As he was faithful at that time, he's still faithful today. As he answered people like you at that time, uh, he will answer you today because those promises in Christ are yes and they are amen unto the glory of God in your life. He's truthful. He cannot lie. It's impossible for God to lie. Every promise he has made unto you, he will fulfill. You can come out of that darkness of confusion, out of the darkness of unbelief, out of the darkness of confusion, saying, will it be, will it not be God? is truthful. It's not a man that he should lie. Not that the son of man that he will change his mind. As he said, and will he not do it? As he spoken, and will he not bring it to pass? He will bring it to pass in your life. The trustworthiness of the almighty God is almighty and because he's trustworthy and because he's truthful and because he's reliable, because he's faithful, that faith Fullness will come, will get to you. Now you can call upon him, and when you call upon him, you can seek for mercy, and you can seek for the provision of God, and you can seek for the fulfillment of the promise of God in your life. He will fulfill everything he has promised you. And you can pray like David. You can say, I know you are trustworthy. I know you are truthful. And I come to you asking, do as thou hast said. On the stormy sea, you said, you'll deliver me, do as thou hast said. When times of affliction come, many of the afflictions of the saints of God, of the righteous, but God delivers him out of them all due as thou hast said. You have said your life will be secured in me. Do as thou hast said. You have said no evil can come near your dwelling if I can abide in the secret place of the Most High. And then you come back to God, you say, do as thou has said, do not fall into the temptation of going to another God. It's a great transgression, it's a great evil, and it's a great iniquity to transgress and trust another God. Don't go to another God, the God of the land, the God of the village, the God of territorial spirits, the God of whatever spirit, the God of the powers of darkness, the God of magic, and the God of occultism. Do not go to any idol. It's a great temptation that it will come to people when there's a challenge and they have prayed and prayed, and then the Lord is wanting to try them to see whether they will keep on believing living on the Lord or no. Do not yield to that temptation because great are the torments and great are the sufferings and great are the afflictions of those who turn to another God. But you come and you say, Lord, transform me through and through from unbelief to total faith in Christ, from a kind of despair to hope in the Lord. There's transformation. And the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. Salvation is available a real salvation that turns us away and sets us free from sin altogether. And then the sanctification, it purifies us within. And it gives us the very nature of Christ. And then it fills us with 
virtue and goodness. And then we can have the mercy of God as we come, lay everything before the Lord. There's transparency. You are transparent before the Lord. And as you are transparent before the Lord, you ask him everything you need to ask him. And then he transfers the power. He transfers the fullness of the Spirit of God in your life. He shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria, to the uttermost part of the earth. Any part of the country where you are, any part of the continent where you are, anywhere you are, there is the power of the Holy Ghost to make you so forceful and to make you fortified and to make you full of faith, to make you faithful as you ought to be. Anything he has done for others in the past, he will do through you and he will do in you and he will do for you even at this present time by the power of the Holy Ghost in your life. Trust the Lord is trustworthy. Believe in the Lord is believable. And depend upon the Lord is dependable. And just tell the Lord, I accept your word. I believe your word. I embrace your word. I trust you. I trust you. You remember? In all those times we looked at today, I trust him. He trusted him. He trusted him. You keep on trusting. And great will be the fulfillment of the promise of God, the power of God, the provision of God, and the prophecy of the word in your life in Jesus' name. Father, we well, thank you tonight and bless your name because you have opened the scriptures unto us. We are asking, O oh Lord, that great will be the fulfillment of your word in every life, in every minister, in their families, in their ministries, in Jesus' name. And I pray for them, and I pray that through them as well, there will be great deliverance. Through them, there will be great salvation. Through them, there will be great healing. Through them, there will be great answers to prayer in Jesus' name. Lift up the courage of your people and lift up the faith of your people that we will know that your word has been given unto us and you are no respecter of persons. If God will answer the prayer of another pastor, he will answer the prayer of every pastor. And Lord, I pray for everyone. We'll have more confidence that as we pray, as we stand on your promises, and we're simply saying, dear, as thou hast said, that your promises will be fulfilled even when we pray in Jesus' name. As everyone has come to you now, come into the throne of grace and coming boldly and seeking help to find help in the time of need. I pray help will come to everyone. Courage will come to everyone. Strength will come to everyone. The fulfillment of the promise will come to everyone. Anointing, greater anointing will come to everyone. Answers to all our prayers will come to everyone. And Lord, I pray for all your people where we will find all the promises of God in Christ to be yes and to be amen in every one of our lives. Fulfill your word in every one of us, Lord, and lift us higher, take us higher, develop us, strengthen us more than ever before, even from tonight in Jesus' name. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.